Today, we're going to explore the latest updates and changes in the Kubernetes platform, specifically in the newly released version 1.28. As always, this update has new features, API changes, improved documentation, cleanups, and deprecations. My name is Mumshat Manbad, and welcome to CodeCloud. A quick note to subscribe to our channel to receive latest updates on Kubernetes as and when they release. So the theme for the 1.28 release is Planternities. It shows how many different people come together to make Kubernetes. This theme celebrates the meticulous care, intention, and efforts put in by people from all over, whether they're experts, parents, students, to get the release to where we are today. Together, we make something that's used all around the world. This release is the second release of 2023 and includes 45 enhancements. 19 are new or improved alpha enhancements, 14 are beta enhancements that are enabled by default from this release, and 12 are enhancements that are now stable. Now, typically, Kubernetes employs a multi-stage release process where each enhancement goes through alpha, beta, GA, and stable phases. So if you are interested in learning more about how an enhancement request goes through uh, Kubernetes, check out our video on Kubernetes enhancement proposals. Um, I'll add a link here. And if you'd like to follow along this video by working on Kubernetes uh, 1.28 instance and trying out things by yourself, then please check out our free playground using the link that's given here. So we host free playgrounds for all versions of Kubernetes and these playgrounds opens up right in your browser so you don't have to set up anything locally. Now let's take a high level look at the changes in Kubernetes 1.28 release. And each release comes with enhancements that can be categorized as features, API changes, documentation, deprecation, and uh, bugs or regression. As such, we have a big list of enhancements in the 1.28 release as listed in the release notes. Uh, we have selected some of the major enhancements out of the list. The first on our list is API awareness of sidecar containers, which is now in alpha. So in Kubernetes, sidecar containers are used to support the main application within a pod by providing supplementary features like logging, monitoring, and networking. However, traditionally, Kubernetes treated all containers within a pod equally without distinguishing between the main application container and the sidecar container. So this lack of distinction led to issues during pod startup and shutdown as the order of container initialization and termination is crucial for many applications. For example, if the sidecar container was not started before the main application starts, then that would lead to missing logs during the initial phase of the application's lifecycle. The same goes around for during the pod termination. So if the sidecar container stops before the main application starts, then the sidecar container would miss logs during the termination. There was no standardized way to define or recognize sidecar containers, leading to workarounds and custom solutions that could be error prone. With the introduction of API awareness of sidecar containers, now sidecar containers can be explicitly marked in the pod specification. This allows Kubernetes to start the sidecar containers before the main application container starts, ensuring that all sidecar functionalities are available before the main application starts. This will also allow Kubernetes to gracefully terminate the main application container before stopping the sidecar containers during the pod shutdown period, ensuring that the sidecar container can complete its tasks, like sending the final logs, even after the main application uh, has stopped. And this also allows Kubernetes to provide a standardized way to define and manage sidecar containers, reducing the need for custom solutions. So how does it work? So let's first refresh our memory about the different types of containers. Now, as you probably already know, a pod can have multiple containers running at all times. So these are regular containers. And then there is a special type of containers called init containers. And these are containers that host scripts or small programs that run during the initialization of the pod to set something up before the pod actually starts. So for example, to wait for a service before the pod starts or to clone a Git repo to a volume or something like that. So the way that it works is if you have a pod with a container and init container specified, when the pod is created, it runs the init container first and once it completes successfully, only then the pod starts. So the init containers traditionally must run to completion and stop before the pod starts. And if there are multiple init containers specified, then they run in the sequence that they're specified one after the other. So remember that once the init container stops, only then the others start. 
So how does that help us solve our problem of being able to run a sidecar container that starts before the main application container starts and continues to run? Because we just learned that init containers start before the main application container start, but it has to finish uh, for the main application container to start. So with Kubernetes 1.28 release, a feature gate named sidecar containers will now allow you to specify a restart policy for init containers. So when the restart policy is set to always, the init container continues to run and the main application container does not wait for the init container to finish before starting. So instead of waiting for the sidecar container to finish, the kubelet starts the main pod containers as soon as the sidecar container init container uh, begins and it's easy in a ready state. So a sidecar container's startup is considered complete when a startup probe succeeds and its uh, post-start handler finishes. And if there's no startup probe, the kubelet deems that this startup complete uh, right after the post-start handler is, is done. So for true init containers that run once before the application starts, you can just leave out the restart policy uh, property. The next major enhancements we're going to talk about is recovery from non-graceful node shutdown. Now, in the dynamic environment of Kubernetes, nodes can sometimes face unexpected shutdowns. These could be due to hardware malfunctions, power outages, or other unforeseen challenges. Now, such abrupt terminations can leave the workloads running on these nodes in a limbo, potentially causing data inconsistencies or service disruptions. For example, imagine running a critical database on a node and the node suddenly goes offline without any warning. This could lead to data corruption, loss of transactions, or even prolonged service outages. So it's crucial for Kubernetes to have a mechanism to detect such events and take corrective actions. Now let's look at an example. Now before this enhancement, if a node shut down unexpectedly, the pods running on that node would remain in an unknown state for a prolonged period. This prevents them from moving to a new operational node. Now, the reason behind this is that the kubelet on the shutdown node isn't available to delete the pods, which means the deployments or stateful sets can't create a pod with the same name. Additionally, if these pods use volumes, the volume attachments won't be deleted from the original shutdown node, and this prevents the volumes from being attached to new operational node, leading to disruptions in the application's functionality. Now, the solution to this is that there's a way to tackle this issue. So users can manually apply a label called node.kubernetes.io slash out of service with either a no execute or no schedule effect to a node, which marks say as unavailable. And if the kube controller manager's node out of service volume detached feature is turned on and a node has this label, any parts on that node without the right tolerations will be forcefully removed. And this speeds up the process of detaching volumes for pods that are ending uh, on the node and letting the pods quickly get back up on another node. Now that this feature is officially promoted to a stable status, the node out of service volume detached feature gate in Kube Control Manager is set to true by default. So while today we need to manually step in to manage nodes that shut down unexpectedly, so when a node is out, you need to go in and set the taint manually by tapping in the command, but there are plans to make this process automatic where Kubernetes can instantly detect a node that's gone offline and swiftly move workloads to a healthy node, all without us lifting a finger. The next in the list is improvements to custom resource definition validation rules, the CRD validation rules, right? So let's say you're a developer working with Kubernetes and you want to introduce a new resource type called database to manage various databases like MySQL, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, et cetera, within your cluster. And this database resource would have attributes like the type or version of storage size and connection credentials. And while Kubernetes is, is powerful, it doesn't natively understand or manage databases, right? So that's why you could create a CRD or custom resource definition. So below is an example for a CRD of a new type called database. And if you didn't know already, so custom resource definitions allow users like you to define and manage these custom database resources, making Kubernetes adaptable to any kind of use case, right? So to ensure that each database resource is correctly configured and doesn't disrupt the cluster's operations, it's crucial to have validation mechanisms in place. So this is where some of the challenges begin with CRD. So to ensure that each database resource is valid, for example, it, to make sure that it has a supported database type or a valid version number, 
developers previously had to use what's called as admission webhooks for validation. While those were effective, these webhooks added some complexity. So implementing, maintaining, and troubleshooting these webhooks was not straightforward for, for teams without deep Kubernetes expertise. This could become a significant operational burden. So if a database resource failed validation, the feedback wasn't always clear. So developers could spend unnecessary time debugging, trying to figure out what went wrong and, and where, et cetera. So with Kubernetes 1.28, the process of validating CRDs, like our database resource, has been greatly simplified and enhanced. Instead of relying on external webhook, developers can now embed validation rules directly within the CRD schema using the common expression language, or CEL. So common expression language is a lightweight and fast expression language that can be embedded in applications to provide an evaluation environment. So with Kubernetes 1.28, you can use CEL expressions in the validation schema of your CRD to enforce more complex rules than what's possible with the open API v3 schema alone. So here's an example of a database CRD that uses uh, CEL for validation. So we add a section called X uh, Kubernetes validator and define a list of rules under it. And the first rule is where we specify that spec.storage size must match the expression of having numbers followed by GI or MI at the end. So the second rule states that the port field under connection credentials must be greater than zero. So if a database resource doesn't meet the validation criteria, the new reason and field path fields provide clear feedback uh, pinpointing the exact issue. So the reason field will contain a description of the validation error, and the field path field will contain the path to the field that caused that particular validation error. So let's look at an example. So consider the following database custom resource um, that violates the validation rules um, that we have specified in the CRD. So in this example, the storage size field has a value of 10G, which does not match the required pattern of ending in GI or MI, and the port field has a negative value, which is also not allowed. So if you try to create this resource, the API server will reject it, and the status field of the resource will contain information about the validation errors. Now, this integrated approach reduces the need for external tools and streamlines the entire CRD schema validation process. Now, the fourth one on our list is automatic retroactive assignment of a default storage class, which has graduated now to stable. Now in Kubernetes, when users create a persistent volume claim or PVC to request storage, they can specify a storage class to determine the type and configuration of the storage provisioned. So not all users are aware of this or may forget to specify a storage class. And without a default mechanism in place, these PVCs would remain unbound, leading to potential confusion and operational overhead. So cluster administrators would need to manually intervene to either bind these PVCs or inform users to specify a storage class, leading to additional operational tasks. So with the graduation of this feature to stable in Kubernetes 1.28, the system can now automatically set a storage class name for a PVC if the user does not uh, provide a value. And furthermore, the control plane also retroactively sets a storage class for any existing PVCs that don't have a storage class name defined. And this ensures that even PVCs created in previous versions of Kubernetes without a specific storage class can benefit from this feature. And the behavior of automatically assigning a default storage class is now automatic and is always active in Kubernetes 1.28, making its transition to general availability. The next one is promotion of the self-subject review API. So in a Kubernetes setup, figuring out who the user is after they've been authenticated can get pretty complicated. You've got different authentication methods like proxy, OIDC, webhook, or even a mix of these. And each of these methods can mess around with the user's attributes, making it tough to know the final identity used for authorization. So let's look at an example to make it clearer. So Imagine you've got a Kubernetes cluster where users log in through a webhook token, and this webhook thing adds certain groups to the user based on the, their roles in the organization. Now, let's say John, one of the users, is trying to figure out why he can't access a particular resource in the cluster, and he knows that his access depends on the groups he's part of, but he's not sure which group the webhook has given him or assigned him to. In the good old days, 
Before the self-subject review API came along, John would have to dig in through the Webhook Authenticator's logs or bug the cluster administrator to find out which group he belongs to. And that's not just a hassle, but also means messing with sensitive logs or bothering an administrator. But with the self-subject review API, now John can simply send a request to that API endpoint and Kubernetes API server will spill the beans on his user attributes, including the groups that he's in. So no more sifting through logs or bugging the admin. He can now troubleshoot his access issue all by himself and quickly. Here's an example. So the user John can make a request to the self-subject review API endpoint like this by sending a post request to the API and the response might look like this. And within that, he's able to see the groups that he belongs to, which is the viewers and editors, as you can see. The next one on our list is backdating generated KubeADM CA certificates. So in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, the KubeADM CA, the Certificate Authority certificates, play a vital role in ensuring secure communication between various components. So they act as a trusted entity that can verify and authenticate the identity of other components within the cluster. In a perfect world, all the clocks in a distributed system like Kubernetes would be perfectly synchronized. However, in reality, slight deviations in time can occur between different parts of the system. And this desynchronization might seem trivial, but it can lead to problems with certificate validation. So certificates have a validity period defined by a start time and an end time. And if a system's clock is out of sync, it might think that a valid certificate is expired or not yet valid. Kubernetes 1.28 introduced a change in how KubeADM generates CA certificates. So now the start time of these certificates is offset by five minutes in the past relative to the current system time. And this offset acts as a buffer to accommodate potential clock desynchronization, reducing the likelihood of certificate validation issues. So the corresponding pull request for this change can be found in the description below. The final item on our list is kubeadm config validate command. So kubeadm, as we all know, is a tool within Kubernetes that helps in bootstrapping a Kubernetes cluster. So it relies on configuration files to know how to set up the cluster. And these files can be intricate and a small mistake in them can lead to problems down the line. And that's what the kubeadm config uh, validate command does for Kubernetes configurations. So the new kubeadm config validate command is like a pre-flight check for your Kubernetes configuration files. So by validating the configuration files before applying them, it helps catch mistakes early in the process. So consider a kubeadm configuration file with a mistake as given in this example. So the service subnet overlaps with the pod subnet, which is actually not allowed. So when you run the kubeadm config validate command with the path to your configuration file, as shown here, the output will show the error like this and it'll tell you what exactly the problem is in specifying the subnets uh, as you've done. Well, that's all for this video. If you liked this video, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for the latest updates on Kubernetes. Check out our detailed blog with examples in the link in the description below. And if you'd like to play around with version 1.28, or any other versions of Kubernetes, use this link to the free Kubernetes playground on CodeCloud that opens up right in your browser. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.